turn to Acts chapter 20, uh, if you would please, uh, Acts chapter 20, and um, I, I cut, touched on this last Sunday night, so I'm not going to uh, say much more on it, uh, but I'm going to just kind of use that to advance uh, where it is we're going tonight. We're dealing with um, the, the Bible being the enemy of our enemies. The, and the reason why is the Bible is the inspired Word of God. It is the testimony of Jesus Christ. It is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. It saves men. It changes men. It stands in opposition to devils. Devils cannot stand to be in the presence, just as they could not stand to be in the presence of Jesus Christ, they cannot be in the presence. They do not like the Bible, the true Word of God. They don't like it. They try to resist it. They try to subvert it. They try to change it, alter it, add to it, take away from it. They try all of these, uh, all of these games, all of these tactics just to keep you and your life and the people you know away from the Word of God. But its strength never diminishes. It never goes away. This Bible never has a season where it can't do anything in somebody's life. Amen? It always remains strong. And so if you want to understand just a little bit about how uh, the, the mess that we've got ourselves in in this country, then follow the history of the Bible in this country. If you want to see and look into the mess that you got into in life, then follow God's Word and its effect in your life and you'll see it. When you walk away from this Bible, there is no protection over you. There's no guidance for you. You're in a land, you're in the land of the lost, my friend, okay? And it's not until God shines the light back on you that you're gonna, that you're gonna be saved, that you're gonna be right with Him. So naturally, this Bible is going to be hated. Paul warned us about this, Acts chapter 20. Verse 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and do all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, here it is now, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace. Now, the devil will subvert this word of grace by means of trying to convince people that they can be saved by some work or a group of works that they perform. That's how... He subverts it. Uh, these men, and, and all they did was get me fired up. Megan, we had men come to our radio station in uh, Turkana. They were Seventh-day Adventist pastors. They all, I guess, got done with their Saturday service. And they all grouped together, and they made a trip to downtown Turkana, went to our radio station office, and said, we'd like to talk to you about whoever this is, on the radio that's speaking out against the Sabbath day and against the Seventh day Adventist church. And the manager of the station said, Well, that's Pastor Hogard. And they said, Well, we got a problem with this man and uh, we don't like what he's saying. And, and, and um, Perkins, the manager, said, Well, sorry about that, but he owns the station so he can say whatever he wants. But they got together, they came together as a group against what I was saying on the radio station. All that does is fire me up. So I'm going to really be a burr in their saddle for a while, all right? Uh, because they are the ones who are speaking perverse things. Let me give you a little piece of information. We have a follower, and he's probably watching right now. Vern, I love you, and I appreciate you, buddy. But we've got a follower of our ministry. A guy used to be a Seventh-day Adventist, and he read all the books. And he had all the information. And God drew him out of that. And every time I need information, I go to him. What do you got for me? And he wrote up a whole deal of things that Ellen White, who started that cult, 
things that she said. She wrote several books. One of them is called um, um, The Great Controversy. And just different things like that. She makes it look like it's talking about Bible prophecy. But Ellen White said that she was in a vision and an angel came and took her in to see heaven. And when she was seeing heaven, she saw there behind the, I guess behind the throne of God on a wall, the Ten Commandments. And they were all written with real glittering, blazing, glorified letters or whatever. And she said they were all had glory coming out of them. But she said the fourth commandment was glowing brighter than all of the other. Fourth commandment is remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And she said now, she said that this angel told her that yes, even though Christ died nailing the Ten Commandments to His cross, the fourth commandment is still in effect and Christ's death and crucifixion on the cross does not cover you for breaking the Sabbath day uh, law. So anybody who goes to church on Sunday, they, according to Ellen White, they have the mark of the beast, and they're all, uh, they're all uh, following after the Catholic Church, and they're all doomed to hell. Only us who keep the fourth commandment can go to heaven. And that is per saying perverse things. Perverse does not mean nasty Talking, talking nasty stuff like, you know, as kids, right? It means anything that has perverted the words of your Bible. And she does. She perverts it. Number one, that was not an angel from God that came and visited her. That was a familiar spirit. Okay? That was another spirit. That's what I've been talking about in Sunday school. That showed her that... All these commandments are lit up, except for the fourth one. It's lit up brighter than all the rest of them. And Christ died and nailed the commandments to His cross, except number four. That is a perverse thing coming from a familiar spirit. And that's the spirit that they follow. Okay, They do not follow the Holy Spirit. They follow a perverse spirit. So Paul said, I commend to you, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace. It's by grace... Or it's nothing with us. Amen? Because you can keep, you can go to church every Saturday from here until the Lord comes all you want to. And I guarantee you, you're going to break nine other commandments. Guarantee you. Okay? So it's got to be about grace. But it's the Word of His grace. He's commending us to the Word of God. Whatever that is, put that away. It's nowhere near as important as what I'm talking about now. Matthew chapter 7. Turn there. Matthew chapter 7, turn there. Here's Jesus, basically the same thing. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. I've been watching them African dogs on YouTube. They'll chase down an impala, 1968 turquoise blue Impala. They'll chase down an Impala. And from the time they get it onto the ground until the time they leave with their bellies are full, about five to six minutes, they will rip that thing to shreds very quickly. They've got very powerful jaws for their size the most powerful jaw of any creature for its size. It's a ratio deal. And the teeth are just razor sharp and they just get in and pull that thing absolutely apart. And they work together on it. While one of them's got the hide, the other one's got some meat and bones in its mouth and they'll pull against each other to pull that hide off so they can both get to that meat. They're amazing creatures when they work together. But they'll just absolutely tear that thing apart and they'll, they'll kill, they'll eat an impala from the belly up while the impala is sitting there watching them do it. They don't kill. They don't kill the creature first. They eat it until it dies. Now listen, ravening wolves in a church or in a family work the same way. They have no conscience. See, these dogs don't think they're doing anything wrong. God designed them this way. This is how they live. They don't eat berries off trees. 
They don't eat grass. They eat things that eat grass. Okay? And so this is how God designed them. And they don't think they're doing anything wrong. Neither do the wolves in sheep's clothing. They have no conscience about what they're doing and about what they destroy. And they destroy, sometimes they can do it very rapidly and very quickly while we're standing there watching them do it. Okay? This is how they work. So he said, in verse 16, You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 32. Turn there very quickly. And um, I'm just kind of laying, the, laying the, um, the, the, the outline here for you. There are two vines in your Bible. Two, uh, there's two of everything practically in your Bible. If there's something good in the Bible, it has an, it has an evil twin. Okay? Uh, Christ has his Antichrist. God has his Lucifer or Satan. Um, for, for the salvation by the gospel, by the grace of God, it's, op, it's evil twin. It, it, it tries to look like it, but it's a salvation by a work or a continuance of a work or anything else. You remember where the Bible says, um, let's see, Ask and it shall be given, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened to you. I, can't, I don't know which one. Some of these new Bibles, these new translations, you know what it says? Keep on asking, and it shall be given. Keep on seeking, and ye shall find. Keep on knocking, and it will be opened unto you. In other words, my Bible says, and he comes. Because what does the Bible say about Jesus? Where is he in a lost man's life? Standing at the door. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Okay? He's ready to come in. And when you ask God... How many times do you, do you have to ask God something before He'll do it? The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. One prayer. Elijah prayed one time, didn't rain for three and a half years. Okay? So that's really all it takes. But this new doctrine that pretends to look like grace tries to get you to believe that if you don't get it just then... We'll keep on and keep on and keep on and keep on. And you have to keep on and keep on. Cause, and if you stop, well, God's not going to give it to you because you did it for a year and then stopped. So God's not going to give it to you now. That's the idea that is taught people is that, well, if you stop, well, obviously you don't have enough faith in God and God's not going to do that because you didn't continue on. That's baloney. That's nonsense. How many times did you have to ask God to save you? And that's the biggest thing there is. Amen? Biggest thing there is. Confess your sins. If, if we shall, uh, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Not if we keep confessing constantly over and over and over and don't fail and don't miss a single one, then He'll do it. That's not what it says. Okay? So anyway, two manuscript lines. There's an evil twin for everything in the Bible. Jesus said in John 15, 1, I am the true vine. Meaning that that vine is always true. It's never wrong. Never a mistake in what it says. Then we have Deuteronomy 32. For their vine is the vine of Sodom and the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons, the cruel venom of ass. So here we have Christ and his evil twin. And we have the word of God and its evil twin itself. The two vines. One is going to be the pure line, and then we have a pure line of manuscripts, Hebrew and Greek, that have come down to us all the way from basically the time of Paul, Peter, James, John, those guys when they were writing those New Testament books, they were copied into the thousands, and they were preserved by God's people in the churches. And we have over 5,000 whole or partial copies of the Greek New Testament that agree with what the King James says and with what a lot of old Bibles in other languages before the 1800s when this new line of manuscripts came out. Uh, a man by the name of Tischendorf 
claims that he found this manuscript that was being thrown away by some monks in a, in a uh, monkery, monkey house, whatever it is, monastery, down in Sinai, Egypt. And he rescued it because they were going to use it to light fires. And he rescued it and he said, oh my goodness, this is a Greek New Testament. And they dated it back to 300 A.D. It falls in line with another Greek New Testament that's sitting in the Vatican archives that they don't let everybody see all of it. It's a very hidden away document. They've made copies of the New Testament parts of it and, and, and give it out to people, but it is a Vatican Bible. The, that Vatican manuscript and this Mount Sinai manuscript disagree with each other in just the four Gospels over 3,000 times. In 3,000 places, in four books of the Bible, these two manuscripts disagree with each other 3,000 times. Not even counting the rest of the New Testament. That is the, is the uh, Greek manuscript line that is, the, that is the foundation of the New International Version. New American Standard Version. A man by the name of um, Frank, Logs Frank Logston. I'm getting that name wrong. But he was friends with the man who was funding the New American Standard translation. And, they, and he brought him in on the work. And when Frank Logston realized what was being done with the Bible and with the translation, he pulled back. He told his, his best friend, he said, I cannot work on this. For what's being done to the Bible, I will not have any part of it. And he spent the rest of his life going from church to church to church, warning them not to use the New American Standard Bible to stick with the King James Bible. Because he knew what they were doing with the New Testament. And he said, I will not stand before God having this on me, knowing in my conscience, knowing what we were doing to the New Testament. He said, I want nothing of it. I think God forgave him of it. Amen? But he lost his friend, and he lost his reputation, and everything. But you can find a couple of his sermons, recorded sermons on YouTube, and you'll hear him say, stay away from that New American Standard. Stay away from it. It's, it's, it's got dragon's poison in it. It is the vine of Sodom. Then we have the vine of Christ. That under, like I said, the King James and a lot of old translations. Now, uh, let's see here. We dealt with that. I'm not going to touch on that. Uh, very quickly, uh, I talked about this. Here's, here's the beast, and he exalts himself above all that is called God. Well, John 1.1 1, 1 says the Word was God. Revelation 19.13, here we have Jesus. He's God. He's called the Word of God. So the Antichrist will always exalt himself above the Bible. So anytime you hear somebody speaking against any word in the Bible, they have an antichrist spirit. Because that's where it comes from. The Holy Ghost will never lead you to the brilliant idea that says, Bless God, I've had it. God's helped me. And oh, God, I thank you for showing me there's mistakes in the Bible. Never happened. What happens, brother, is they go to Bible college or seminary or they read a bunch of websites. Those tell them that there's mistakes in the Bible. And the Bible, did, the King James not translated right. And it's got a bunch of errors. We need to follow these new manuscripts because they're better manuscripts. The, the Internet will tell them that. God's Spirit will not tell them that. Okay, now, um, 2 Corinthians, chapter 2, verse 17, For we are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. In Paul's day, they were already, there were evil men who were already then corrupting the Word of God. Does anybody know how they were doing it? Anybody want to take a guess? They didn't have publishing houses back then. They didn't have printers. They didn't have computers. They didn't have internet. Here's what they would do. These people would get a copy of, let's say they would get a copy of the Gospel of Matthew. And they would read it. And because of their Gnostic beliefs, they did not believe that Jesus was equal with God. 
They did not believe any of that. So as they went through the Gospel of Matthew, they found words that they didn't like, that didn't agree with their doctrine, so they took them out. This flat took them out. Anything that they didn't agree with, they, they dismissed and they took it out. That verse in Matthew about prayer and fast, this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting, gone. The prayer deal is there, but the word fasting is not there. They took it out. They disagreed with it. And they did that with Paul's letters, Peter's, book of Revelation. They did it all through the New Testament was that they took words and things out of those documents that they didn't like. So then they had a different set of Greek manuscripts that was different from what the churches were putting out and producing during this time. Does does everybody follow me on that? Okay? Paul said it. We are not as many which corrupt the Word of God. Okay? How many... How many pastors and theologians and scholars and Bible colleges out there that corrupt the Word of God versus the pastors who look at this book and say, there cannot be a mistake in this Bible. What's the ratio here? This to this, you think? There are many which corrupt the Word of God. By the way, they even didn't like that verse, so they changed it. Even in the New King James Version, they say... For we are not like others who peddle the word of God for profit. Not corrupt the word of God. But they do peddle the word of God for profit. That's why they do that. All right. Then 2 Corinthians 11, very quickly. Uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time with this because I want to get kind of where I want to go tonight. I've been doing this in Sunday school for, what, six or eight months now? Same verse. <laughs> anyway. Uh, in, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 4, For if for a faith that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or you receive another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Another gospel will, will come from another Bible. And another Bible will always speak of a different Jesus. The Jesus in my Bible said, Get thee behind me, Satan. That's the Jesus in my Bible. The Jesus in the New American Standard Bible never said that. Okay, that is a different Jesus. The Jesus in the King James said, This kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. The Jesus in the other Bibles never said fast, never said anything about fasting. Okay, took it out. And you, that's what you're going to find. You're going to find a different Jesus in these Bibles. Then, then you will, the, the King James and, and that line of manuscripts and all the Bibles that have been produced from that line... They all have the same Jesus. They all come from the same vine. They're all the true vine. And you have these other vines that are the vine of Sodom. They are producing the fruit of Sodom. Okay? And God destroys that. All right? So, if it's another gospel, it's another Bible. All right? Uh, let's see. Here's, here's proof of that. First Peter 1.25, But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Remember. There is the gospel that says, Ask and it shall be given, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. Or, there is another gospel that says, Keep asking and keep on uh, seeking and keep on knocking. A continuation of works in order to get God to connect with you or get God to do something for you versus, God, I'm a helpless, worthless sinner. God, would you save me? Boom! Save. Okay? If God knows your heart's true. Colossians chapter 1, verse 5, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, where have you heard of heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel? They are connected together. You cannot say, I believe the gospel, but I don't believe all the words that are in my Bible. You cannot say that. Because they're connected together. The gospel comes from the word. We, uh, we have this expression called, I te- I'm telling you, it is the gospel truth. Right? You ever heard people say that? That's the gospel truth. Jerry Clower used to say that. I'm telling you, it's the gospel truth. What he means by that is he believed that the word of God was true in everything that it said, and the gospel was the word of God. And if he said it, and he said it was the gospel truth, then it's as true as the gospel is. And anybody who would say that must believe 
that the gospel, the word, is true. Okay? The gospel, again, is not just this one little thing where, okay, it's the gospel that saves you, you can be saved. The gospel is the book. The book is what declares the gospel. And it doesn't just do it, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Does it all through Paul's writings, does it in the book of Revelation, does it in the Old Testament. You see it all over in typology and prophecy and doctrine. You see it everywhere. It, it is the entire word of the truth of the gospel. Uh, let's see here. Let's do... Oh, let's, let, me, let me hit on this, because this, this is another reason why the devil hates the Bible. Watch this. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So it makes it pretty clear. Okay? No difference between them. John 1.14, and the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and what? They're connected together. A lie cannot be part of God's grace. An error or a mistake or verse poorly translated or whatever cannot be part of God's grace because it's full of grace and truth. Okay? Um, when something is full of something, when you get full at the buffet, is there any room left for anything else? You're, you're, you're getting close, Matthew. Put you over my leg and whoop you right in front of the camera. The video will go viral. John 1, 14. Oh, we already read that. The Word was made flesh. Okay? So if it's full of grace and truth, is there anything room? Is there any room left for errors? It's full of, it's full of truth. John 6, 63, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. So it doesn't matter if it's Christ, the Holy Spirit, God the Father himself, they are all represented equally by this book. So you cannot separate the Bible and its total truthfulness from God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit cannot do it and believe, believe every word of the Bible. That's 2 Thessalonians 2. I like this. Then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his... And Jesus is not just going, Take that, devil! He's speaking. He is speaking words. And when the devil hears Jesus talk, it makes him shake. He don't like it. He tries to work against it, but eventually, in the presence of the Word of God, even the devil himself must leave. They do not like the presence of the Word of God. What is it that's going to destroy the Antichrist? Your Bible. It'll destroy. This is what. It, so let's let's fabulize this. Let's say that there was a, a terrible, powerful, magical enemy, and the kingdom has a magical spear that can only be wielded by one special young boy. I'm making a movie here. One special young boy, and he finds this spear, and he's going after that evil enemy with the magic spear, right? You've seen this movie before, right? So the enemy says, we must kill the boy and take the spear so no one can get us. That's what I'm trying to tell you about the Bible. The devil knows that this can destroy him. That he cannot stand against this. He knows that if God's people start building a wall of Scripture, that that wall is impenetrable. And there's no breaches in it, no errors in it, no holes, no mistakes that He can wiggle through and get into you and your family and your church. He knows that. And He knows that the words of the mouth of Jesus are what's going to destroy the Antichrist. And so in His mind, we must destroy the Bible. Must destroy that sword. Amen?
So now watch this. Here's the Catholic Encyclopedia, volume, volume 13. Here's what the great mother, holy, Roman, Catholic, harlot church says about the Bible. The belief in the Bible as the sole source of faith is unhistorical, illogical, fatal to the virtue of faith, and destructive of unity. Now notice that they did not say against Bible doctrine. Okay? They did not say the belief in the Bible as the sole source of faith is unbiblical. They didn't say that. They said it's unhistorical. Meaning, in the history of the Catholic Church, we never said that. And I agree with them. They never said it. They killed the people who did. Illogical. Well, then they got their logic messed up. Fatal to the virtue of faith. Faith in what? Faith in the Catholic Church. You know what saved... Uh, um, I want, I'm trying to think of, I'm trying to say Geraldo Rivera, but that's not who it was. Alberto Rivera. Alberto Rivera was a Jesuit Roman Catholic priest in the Vatican, in secret meetings in the Vatican. And he was saved because he started reading the Bible. And the clutches of Satan over his life came off when he decided to yield to what the scripture was saying, knowing that the Catholic Church was the whore, and he wanted no more part of it. And he came out. Amen? And there's been others. We have people watching now who have come out of the Catholic Church and are going back no more because of this book. Okay? So they hate it, and the Catholic Church does not want it's people reading it, including the present Pope. Okay, now watch this. Here is the instruction of the Roman Pontifical Biblical Commission, 1964. This was right after Vatican II, okay, which was in 1963. The fundamentalist approach, fundamentalism is us. We believe in the foundational, fundamental ideas of the faith. Our, our Bible is, we believe in sola scriptura, which means only Scripture, period, the end. The fundamentalist approach is dangerous, for it is attractive to people who look to the Bible for ready answers to the problems of life. That would be me. It can deceive these people, offering them interpretations that are pious, but illusory. You know what that means? They are illusions. If you believe the Bible, you believe in something that is an illusion. It's not really real. Instead of telling them that the Bible does not contain an immediate answer to each and every problem. Without saying as much in so many words, fundamentalism actually invites people to a kind of intellectual suicide. It injects into life a false certitude. Meaning, if you are certain that you believe the Bible is right in everything, the Catholic Church says that is false. When Peter said, we have a more sure word of prophecy, that you do well, to, that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. For it unwittingly confuses the divine substance of the biblical message with what are in fact its human limitations. So here's, here's the Catholic church. Here's the Pope. And he's saying, here's the Bible. And if you think all the answers are found in the Bible, then you're wrong. Don't trust the Bible. I'm the Pope. Trust me. That's what they say. Don't trust the Bible. Trust me, the Pope. Okay? Because I'm, I won't say that. It's mean. It's bad. Okay? The Pope, who is a dirty, rotten, filthy, fornicating sinner, because they will not let these priests marry women and be right. Amen? So these guys are fornicators, or sodomites, or both, or pedophiles. And they want you to believe them, but don't trust your Bible. This is why we are not Bethel Catholic Church. 
and never will be. Amen? Now, the Roman Pontifical Biblical Commission. There was a man on that commission by the name of Carlos Martini. Okay? He was a Jesuit priest. And this Jesuit priest sat on the committee made up of mainly European scholars who determined what the Greek text of the New Testament would be. And this commission with a Jesuit priest sitting in the group decided that the majority manuscript divine that the King James Bible came from is no good. So, in the Greek New Testament, which is where all of the new translations come from, including the New King James, that Greek New Testament, it is where all the new Bibles come from, it is what's studied in all of the uh, seminaries, most of the Bible colleges. Most pastors who say they look into the original Greek, read from the Greek New Testament that was formed in part by a Jesuit priest. That is Rome drawing people away, drawing the churches away from believing the Word of God. They had their man on the inside, and he wasn't even hiding. Okay, I spotted him because I'm looking at the commission, and there's a couple guys on there that I names that I knew from Bible college. And I'd never met them; they were not my teachers. I just knew the names from some of the books. And I'm looking at this guy, going, "He's not wearing a jacket and tie like these other guys. Who was he? He was a Jesuit priest wearing his little white deal." Okay, here he is Chris Pinto sent me this. <clears throat> 